Let's get ready to rumble! This is your nation jam-packed show today. Peloton of five percent. What's up, discipline investor? We got Benzinga CEO Jason Raznick here with us. The man, the myth, the legend, Tom Nash. Peter Schiff on the Power Hour with us live today. Interesting, different, unique, innovative companies. Mia, you are live with us on the Power Hour. What's up? Thank you so much for inviting me on. Jessica Billingley, that is the CEO of Aperna. The best trade idea resource out there. Yo, what's going on, Producer AB? What's going on, Zinger Nation? Happy Tuesday! Look at that. We, we like didn't even really have to do any work and we were already at tuesday tuesday like a full day of work in and then we get to tuesday we're already there baby let's go let's fire it up let's get right into it producer ab uh last week trade i made right into the close on friday i bought dd dd global it's like the uber of china let's take a look and see how that one's doing did you buy it because kramer told you to it's not looking good did kramer do that Kramer said, uh, yeah, he said, like, if you're going to speculate on a Chinese company, buy DD. He's like, yes. buy, he said, buy as many shares of this company as you can. <laughs> all right. We've never had one as bad as that. All right. I mean, no, we've I, I personally good. have given out some trade ideas. I've given out some good ones, Luke, but not all of them have been great. Um, you know, one stock that I've been looking at. Well, here let's let's talk about DD more for a second. All right, yeah, let, let let let's do this. So 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 if you guys are just joining us, this is the Power Hour. This is the Trade Idea Show. Let's go. Let's get after it. Uh, on the agenda today, I want to talk about DD and the Chinese stocks and and some plays off of that. I'm I'm lo- taking a hard look at Baba, but we'll talk about those. Uh, Ripster, Ripster47 on Twitter gave us two new stock picks on the show last Thursday. So let's let's talk about each of those. Um, Ford getting hammed a little bit today, so so I want to actually sell calls against Ford. Uh, CleanSpark, CarParts.com, those are all tickers on my list to talk about. So you know, it's it's a pretty jam packed show. Uh, we're also going to be talking to the Mulligan brothers, who are making a movie about the AMC story, the Ape Investor, um, and then we'll be bringing in the money stocks on at 12:45 p.m. ET. So that is a jam-packed day if I've ever seen one. How's that? I'm pumped. I'm pumped. We have a packed Tuesday, as always, one day away from hump day. And, yeah, exactly. it's coming coming up quick this week, Luke. I mean, it's – oh, we got Young Investor in the chat. What up, Zach? How we doing? All right, let, let, let's open this week up with some fun. How about that? All right. I love fun. I like fun. All right. So 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 we we have not done a chat challenge in quite a while. All right, I mean it, it's been like like a minute. So so I'm saying let's do a chat challenge. Let, let's make it a fun one. Uh, we're calling the price of DD. All right, that's how we're starting this this shortened week off in the chat. I'm dropping in the link to the Google Doc now. We are calling what is the price of DD Global going to be at this time on Friday. If you've missed the news, let, let, let me walk you through the journey. Um, and here, you know what? I'm, I'm going to let, let, let's make the spreadsheet a little more clear. You need, we need your name and then you need the Friday price guess. Okay, so so we, we, we have the spreadsheet, but let, let's talk through the DD story for a second. So zooming out, the, the stock opened for trading on June 30th. What was that? Wednesday of last week, I believe uh let, let's do a quick confirm yep so so the stock ipo'd initial public offering last wednesday again this company we, we looked at it when it had its ipo it is the uber of china it's like a bit ubiquitous in china matt hammond our ipo expert who's gonna be joining us at 1 p.m et here uh he's used dd many times he said it's everywhere in china all right um stock stock open for trading wednesday on friday we got news that, that Chinese uh, officials were looking at the company for security concerns, specifically with, uh, uh, you know, con- concerns related to, to user data. All right. And guys, don't, don't put your, your price guess in the, the chat on YouTube. There's a link to a Google Doc. Everybody can access it. All right. So, so we can track how, how we're doing throughout the week. But, but Friday, security concerns from China. Sunday morning. Uh, Wall Street Journal breaks a story that says Chinese officials have asked uh, app stores to remove the app until they get the, these 
uh, security concerns worked out. Uh, I've heard that the company does have Jack Ma ties, and we've seen how Alibaba has gotten smacked around over the years. Um, you know, so literally within a week of it having its IPO, its its public company debut, uh, you 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 have the uh the app getting taken off of the app store all right so 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 price right now is what we're sitting right around 12 12 dollars 30 cents we're guessing as a group where the stock is going to finish at this time on friday all right a A B. what what's yours we need you need to put yours in there i'm gonna put mine in there yeah, I'm going to go ahead. So we got young investor in the chat saying 15. So he thinks it's actually going to go up a couple dollars. I'm from going here. higher too. You're going higher too? Okay. I'm going higher. And I will I will say this, Luke, about, you know, because this isn't the first time that we've seen, you know, a Chinese company get cracked down with regulation. Of course, uh, luck and coffee comes to mind for me. Yep. Um, I will say this, Luke, I'll give credit where credit is due. China's regulatory uh, process seems to be seems to work if they crack down on these companies like very quickly. You know what I'm saying? What? No, I have no idea what you mean. Like, look, like if China really, if 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 they just wanted this company to to run amok and to, to run the share price up, they wouldn't have cracked down on it. The regulatory system, it seems like they, you know, really will will shut down a, a company, took them off the app store immediately, whatever. I mean, it's. It's interesting to see. Yeah. So, so, so here, here's my thing with it, and why I suspect that it'll go higher is, is that because Didi is an integral part of life in China, right? Like, like imagine if it was just Uber and there was not like, like Lyft as a major second player. That, that, that's why I think that the stock goes higher. I, I think ultimately, you know, you, you, you have the Chinese government showing everyone who, who's boss and who's in charge. Um, you know, the tiny pie in the chat saying. Yeah, putting the money on the CEO. I'm going to say something embarrassing about himself on TV as a punishment. I think that's basically what's going to happen. The company's going to apologize. There may be some executive turnover. Some people might be forced out of the company who, who've been there for a while. But ultimately, for us shareholders, I don't think this matters a ton. And 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 we see the stock go higher. So 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 look look looking at the chat. So so we'll add this line. Uh, Monday price is going to be twelve thirty. Is what 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 we set it live at. Okay, uh, the the lowest anybody is guessing is ten bucks. So that would be below the low that we saw this morning of ten dollars ninety cents. The max of fifteen thirty, average uh, twelve dollars ninety eight cents. Median price thirteen fifty. That's my guess as, as to where this thing finishes up. And A B, what's the prize? What are we gonna give away? We're making everybody you know warm their fingers up, type in the guesses, getting started on the on this Tuesday. What what's the prize gonna be for the the, the person who calls it right? One free ride of any DD. No, because then you got to go to China for that. We'll do. Um, should we do like a should we do like a twenty five dollar Uber gift card to keep it on? Yes, yeah, so a twenty five dollar Uber gift card. That is the move. Yes, let's go. All right. So 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 Uber of China, the the copycat company. If you have the closest guess as to where the stock is going to be at this time on Friday. Producer AB called it. You are getting a $25 Uber gift card. The irony is there. Yes, I am all about it. All right. There, there are the guesses. I'm going to go ahead and lock down the spreadsheet in a minute. So if you haven't guessed yet, you better hurry up and get it in there. Um, and, and let's pivot over to, to, to a couple ideas. Uh, if anybody has a favorite Chinese stock, you have a stock that you like, um, a, a Chinese stock, drop it in the chat. Let, let, let's take a look through some of these tickers. Baba is the one that I like. Um, I, I generally have a long-term bullish thesis on China. I, I, I hate to say it, but I think it's likely that in my lifetime, China will be the world superpower. Um, I do have Chinese exposure via the ETF, FXI, Foxtrot X-Ray India. Um, the ETF is getting rocked today um, as, as all the Chinese names are getting rocked. Um, but but if, if we're doing individual stock picking, uh, Baba is the name that I like. It, it's the one that I trust. 
Um, the, the, the stock is still in a free fall right here. Here, here are daily candles. I'm going to go ahead and zoom us in. Uh, we're, we're running up against this, this series of lows that we have right around 209 here. And then 204 is, is going to be our last stop before the bottom could absolutely fall out in this name. 204, that's a 52 week low. We're six bucks away from it right now. Um, I, I'm, I'm not making a, a trade in Baba right now, but, but it is on the close watch list this week. If we see Baba catch some momentum sometime before the 204 level, I'm going to hit it long on a swing trade. That That's my take on it. Um, if we see it fall below 204, then I'm just I'm just going to take it off the watch list, let it figure itself out, and take a look at some point in the future. But I'm look taking a really close look at Alibaba to hit a swing trade if it if it starts to catch some momentum off of 204. We we zoom into the one minute candles. I mean, the thing has still been in a free fall this morning since the open. I'm not going to try to pick a bottom in this thing. But but again, that's my move on Baba. Some of the other Chinese names in the chat that are getting thrown out. Neo, I think it's really tough to add any auto auto stock right now. Um, I, I'm still sitting on a forward position. We'll talk about that one in a minute. But I think it's tough to, to be sitting on, on any auto stock right now uh, or, or to be adding any position in an auto stock right now, which actually brings me over to carparts.com. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, let's let's look at JD as well. That's sort of the other big, you know, be, best in breed type name. Oh, shout out Neil in the chat, hanging out. Cool. Um, I I think you can think of JD as a similar way way as Baba, right? It, it's coming up on what's pretty much a 52 week low here. If it catches energy before it gets down and breaks through that low, then then I think you're okay and and you can ride this thing for a swing trade long. The the one that I'm gonna be doing it with. Uh, is Baba, JD.com, I think you can think about it in a similar way. But there's just so much headline risk and so much bullshit about these, like, like with these Chinese names. So let's look at this. All right, well, does this chart look weird to you, Producer AB? This is a one-day, one-minute chart. One-minute candles. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look great, although... It, it the looks stock like it went from 54 to 83 to 58. It looks like it's consolidating right where it's at now, which I do like. I've talked about that before that, you know, I, I like when a stock's trading sideways for a little bit. Neil's asking, what am I doing on Bloviation Nation? First of all, Neil, you know darn well that is not the name of the show. This is the Zinger Nation Power Hour where we provide trade ideas, maybe, maybe a joke here or there. Um but yeah, I mean, as Neil's saying, he's saying buy it. He sees this consolidation. You mentioned ETF, talking about Chinese. One that I've been looking at is CQQQ, which is one that tracks kind of the, the technology companies in China. Um, so if you're long technology and you're long China, this could be an ETF for you. It is also getting hammered today. I'm going to speculate, assume it's because, or part of it is that Baba is in there and Baba is getting crushed today. Um, but back to... Back to Weibo. I mean, I look. Well, do you, do you know the news that was out on this one this morning? Uh, I saw there was news. You might need to. All right. So that. here's what happened, guys. Stock goes from 55 to 83 to 58. Okay. Exactly like the graph of X squared. I guess that'd be negative X squared. All right. Uh, basically what happened, there was a report out that the chairman of the company was going to be taking it private, basically buying out the entire company, like an M&A deal at $90 per share. An hour later, we hear that that news is fake. More fake bullshit news. Stock is back down to where it started. Wait, was it? Did he put out the fake news, or did someone just make that up completely? Uh, it was a media report. So we, you don't know who fed it to the media organization, right? They, they, the, the media, it was a Reuters report, not Benzinga. Benzinga doesn't make mistakes like that, okay? Just Reuters does. Um, but uh, uh, somebody fed it to Reuters. They had some source on it, obviously. And then the company came out and denied it later. Bloomberg backed it up and said their sources said it's not not true either. Um, so 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 that's the news on Weibo. And, and again, ticker, ticker WB Whiskey Bravo. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is that again, the, these a lot of these Chinese stocks are are, are pretty screwy. Yeah, and we have uh, I see Rod in the chat. He's asking why buy anything from China. Look, I get the sentiment. You're saying you know you're saying. You, you don't want to see like China become the, the world superpower over America. But look, at the end of the day, if there's opportunity in the markets and there's money to be made, it's almost it's irresponsible as an investor to not look at the opportunities there. 
Um, I don't know how you feel about that, Luke, but um, the, the market is continuing to grow in China. It's looking like a good investment opportunity in a number of different parts. I do understand why some people might be hesitant to do so. I myself, however, am looking at what opportunities I think will I can find in a, in a growing market in China. Yep. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I've got a, a long-term bull thesis on China. Again, Alibaba, I think that's the best in breed name. Um, you know, least volatility, least amount of, of Weibo type news like we saw this morning. And, and again, I'll be looking to hit that one on a swing trade long. And then core holdings, I do have FXI um, and in decent size. It's getting hammed today with, with the DD news. Um, but, but that's why I have it. And guys, chat challenge for DD officially closed. Good job. Uh, uh, average price 1310, medium price 1350. So as a group, we are expecting Didi to finish the week higher. Let's see if we get some news out of this thing. It could be a lot higher than that. If there's not news, then then I think that that we get a nice little slow trend higher again. Last price 1230. Whoever gets the closest price is getting <laughs> a $25 Uber gift card. All right, that 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 that's that's the move there. Um, all right, let, let, let's pivot over to autos for a second, Producer AB. And guys, if you have auto mobility stocks, uh, drop them in the chat. We got auto deliveries last week from pretty much all the major auto manufacturers. With the exception of Tesla, none of them really looked good. Anybody who was in that long Tesla trade with us, shout out to you. Boom, we nailed that one. Closed it out, took the money and ran. Um, but, but let's talk about Ford. Ford core holding of mine. Uh, st stock is off today. Um, it's time for me to sell some some calls against this thing. So I own both the stock and then the the where is our Ford option chain there? It so is. what are you gonna do with the cash that you get from options from selling the calls? You're gonna buy more shares? Uh, no, I'm just gonna throw keep the cash in the account. Just free up some cash in the account. I like it, it. exactly. Right, it's not like we're getting a ton of money for selling these calls, um, but but let's go. I mean, we get almost nothing. Oh, look, we do have a special guest with us. We do. Oh, Jason Rasnick joining the Power Hour. <laughs> uh -oh. oh, but we can't hear him. All right, we'll take him off. Uh, almost ready. All right, so so we're gonna look two weeks out on Ford. Well, we're we're, we're we're gonna sell the calls. Um, Basically, what it does, we, we get a it's a it's a bearish position. It cancels out the stock that we own. Uh, we we get a little bit of cash. There we go. We're we're filled. Uh, so so we, we get a little bit of cash for selling the calls. The the reason why I do this every couple of weeks, it's not a ton of money at once, but you do it over the course of a year. It brings our cost basis on the stock way down. Like our average cost basis on Ford is probably somewhere in the sixes at this point. Just we've been selling calls against the stock the whole way up. Um, I am still holding on to the long calls that we have in the stock. Um, they're getting rocked today. So you see today the, the long calls, we're off 10%. We're still up 329% of unrealized profit. But but we're going to hold on to them for now. Uh, I, I, I want to get a sense of, of what the EV flow is going to look like out of the company. Uh, we should be getting news in the next couple of weeks. So that's what we'll be keeping an eye on. But but that that's where I'm at with that one. And, and Jason in the chat, he's saying he's, if we get up to that 80 like number, he's going to rejoin us. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, but but there you go. Onus okay. is on you guys. Uh, other auto stock to talk about, the, the one that, that I like, as you know, producer AB, carparts.com, ticker PRTS. Um, we, we bought this one a few weeks ago at 15 bucks. We're up to 18 and a half now. The... Here, here's my thinking. I think that that the weak auto delivery numbers that we got last week are actually good for a stock like CarParts.com, and 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 here here's here's the play for it. Um, we 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 see inventories are at record lows for new vehicles. It means people are going to hold on to existing vehicles for longer uh, because the price of new vehicles are increasing. That means they're going to need to buy more car parts, and that's why I think the the chip shortage. Uh, slow delivery numbers, low amount of inventory is actually a good thing for carparts.com, ticker PRTS. 
Um, I'm potentially going to expand this position. It's a good size position for me now. I, I think it may make sense to, to increase. If you guys don't know this, this company's business, they sell car parts online. Only 3% of car part sales are done on the internet. They're out there with the mission to change that. Strong revenue growth, almost 100% year over year revenue growth. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's an interesting play for those reasons. So I'm gonna throw this one out to the chat, guys. If you like the the carparts.com play, drop me a one in the chat. If not, drop me the two and tell me what better ticker you like. Okay. I I, I wanna know if, if anybody has a better auto mobility, EV, etc. ticker. I'm curious where everyone is at. Pro Producer A B, where, where are you at with, with this this name in particular or or auto space in general? So I agree. Did he freeze? I don't know. I didn't know if it was just me. He, Clearly, he, it's not he, just me. He, he he always he does that a lot. I don't know why he freezes like that, but um, I'll jump in. Um, we'll see when he – it happened last week too. So you know what stock I'm getting killed on? Like I think I lot? cut out for a second. You think? Yes, you did, sir. Yes, you did. Okay, give your idea. They're, they're, they're looking – hey, Neil Hamilton. I love it. I love it. Um – I don't know what happened here in the studio room, but base, essentially I was just saying I agree with the thesis that, you know, people will be more incentivized to fix up their old car as opposed to going out to buying a new car or buying a used car because both used cars and new cars, they're really expensive right now. Um, so for that, I do like the parts trade. I would like to see if um, – I, I want to see, Luke, I want to see like a comparison to parts and, compet and competitors. You know, we have other publicly traded car parts companies, um, and it seems like parts, carparts.com, could become the leader in the e-commerce side of that industry. Yeah, you, you got your O'Reilly's out there, et cetera. Okay. Right, and I, I would be surprised if we didn't see like O'Reilly's, Advanced Auto Parts, some of those other companies take a stronger interest in the e-commerce side of things. Um, and if car parts can really be like the chewy of that industry then it's then it's really strong if they lose some of their market share to some of these other more established companies um then it might be you know then it might not be as strong okay you want to know one stock that i got killed on guys yep let's hear it i don't know how i bought this much of it because when i bought my call options i usually keep it low but I, alk we were in you know that day that i was buying all those like travel airlines and travel stocks ALK, I never trimmed my calls. I guess got executed for too much. <laughs> I'm gonna so lose you, 40... you basically bought a ton of stock? I bought a ton of ALK options. Um, like I usually spend like anywhere from 800 to 1200, 1400 my first buy, and then I'll whatever, and then I'll dial into it if it starts ro rolling my way. I spent $4,200 on those call options for ALK, and I'm gonna, and they're down to 250 bucks. <laughs> like I'm gonna lose everything on that one. For two hundred dollars, which dumb, dumb, dumbo, you know. I I have a call. Wait, so you're still in the calls, or it rolled into stock? The calls haven't expired yet. Nope, they have not expired. Yet. Okay. <laughs> I don't do like these rollover things. The calls are going to probably expire worthless unless we have a huge run in ALK. All right, so if you guys are booking flights, help Jason out. Make Alaska Air your airline of choice. And, and yes, please do. And then the other thing um, that. You know, Tesla had a nice run last week. Um, I've been a long time, you know, bull of Tesla. I sold a little bit of shares today, very small amount, <gasps> like less than 1%. Say I have 530 shares, I sold five shares. What I would like to do is buy some protection on my Tesla position. So, like, long-term puts. Um, I don't know. I would like to maybe do that on the show, but let's, it's, you know, Tesla's 31% of my portfolio. And, um, and so, and I've cashed out my portfolio. I've sold some stuff and, you know, the BTNs, those ones have been doing well. But um, Tesla, I would like to buy some of these long-term calls um, that, like, protect me if it went down to, like, 580 is what I want protection to. Yeah, Jason, if it makes you feel any better on the ALK calls, I have calls that expire, or I should say options that expire worthless every Friday. Um, it's kind of like a weekly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I did buy Eli calls, uh, this morning. Oh, I love that. I love that. I'm so long golf right Cali now. Golf. We talked about this to, with, uh, Ross Gerber as well. Just that there's so many yep. different of the show. demographics. I bought, I bought it. I bought Eli when Ross is on the show. 
Beautiful. I, I, my, I have a call option that's getting absolutely smoked today on ticker AFRM. It's a firm. Uh, and it was actually up like a percent at one point. I checked my Robinhood portfolio and was like, oh, I'm doing pretty well on it. And then the stock just completely tanked. It is now down. Well, it was down 3%. Looking at it now, it's only down. Can we get that one pulled up real quick, Luke? AFRM. Are you using yep, ben- and then we're going to have to click over to our guests in a second. Are you here. using Benzinger Pro? I am, but I'm on my. Uh, I was looking at it on my laptop right now, so I'd have to get it pulled up on here. Wait. But see, if you if you scroll down on details, Luke, uh, it looked like they had some analyst ratings that, you know, they were getting like buy ratings on uh, from different analysts, and it seems like the stock has just gotten hammered down like two. You see, most of them are, most of them are bullish, and so essentially what this company is doing is they're allowing consumers to. So say you go to book an Airbnb, and the Airbnb is two thousand dollars. You can pay for it through a firm with interest-free payments over like eight payments over three months, you know? So my thesis on it is that people this summer, you know, as we get out of COVID, will have a lot of interest to travel, do all these things, and might not have the cash up front to, to do it. But say, Luke, say you're like, oh, we're going to, to Traverse City this weekend, and I don't have enough money to go. I'm going to want to do it through a firm because I've had a year long where we haven't had time to to you know, have fun, vacation, party. I'm not going to want to miss out on trips because I can't pay for it. So I'm going to use a firm. Um, and it seems like they have good institutional backing, all this stuff. But for some reason, the stock just keeps getting hammered. Yeah, I just don't know what the valuation is compared to the P ratio and all that stuff. So that's uh, on a firm. I mean, I know a firm pretty well. They've been at our FinTech Awards. but Oh, Neil's could- saying people are even buying clothes with a firm. Wow. Yeah. Maybe you want a, a new a, a new pair of nice shoes. I want some Balenciagas or something. I can go through a firm. Pay yeah. less, whatever. Okay. You know, pay less. Okay. You know what stock is doing well though for me, and I've talked about it on the show a bunch. I know we're getting hammered today, but this stock is still doing well for me, and it, it is Generic, G N R C. All right. Well, Jason, why don't we bring our guests on, and then let's hit Generic afterward. How's that? Yeah, and Amazon today too. All right. Peace. We, we moved him earlier, and now we're making him wait. The, the so, Mulligan so brothers? Bring let's bring them on. They take Mulligans? They, they take Mulligans. Vo- Voyages. Mulligan brothers, yeah. what is going oh. on? Welcome to the Power Hour. Loving the mustache. You know, oh, it's the only way it grows, man. There, there we go. Uh, and, and you guys are different than our normal guests in, in that, that you're not necessarily stock traders per se, but, but you're creating a documentary <laughs> about the AMC trader. So, yeah, so no, no, that's us- not quite the right way to put it. Uh, we're creating right. a documentary about uh, what's happening with the retail investors and what happened with the GME squeeze, naked short selling, failure to delivers, the situation that continues to happen, and what's wrong with our markets surrounding the situation. Okay, so 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 I I didn't intro it appropriately. So so even j- just give give us a little bit more context. So, so you mentioned you know the the GME short squeeze. Uh, I guess can you take us through what what you guys are looking to cover from you know you know be, beginning to end, uh, and and then what inspired the creation of the film? Beginning to end, woof! Can't give it all away. All right, well, um, you know, just what we're doing. Give us uh, a, a lot of why we started this project um, was us being bought into GameStop and AMC stocks ourselves, like so many millions of people and yeah. institutions. Me and AB in that group with you. Yeah, <laughs> Scion, <laughs> Domo Capital, whoever else. So all of these people um, bought into these stocks with uh, a good play. They made their own decisions, did their own research, did their own due diligence. And what happened in January when Robinhood halted the buying but not the selling of these stocks hit us pretty hard and financially on on one side, but on the other side, we thought there's something major going on, something wrong happening. And we wanted to set the record straight because what we were seeing on the media uh, was giving an incredibly inaccurate description of who these people are that are investing in these stocks. Uh, And that same narrative keeps being told today. So we want to tell the real story of who these people are, what's happening in our markets. And we'll be using some pretty incredible people uh, we interviewed in our film to talk about these issues and what the path is moving forward. Awesome. Well, we, we actually had a, we had a show, this show on back in January when the, the GameStop thing was first going on. So the stock mm-hmm. had already gone up to about like $40. So the squeeze had already kind of started, but then we brought on Andrew Left 
from uh, Citron, who was a short seller of GameStop. And when we brought him on, we got flooded in the chat uh, from people from Reddit, you know, Wall Street Bets and everything. And it started this whole thing. And in the hour or in like the 30 minutes that left was on the show, the stock went from 40 to like 75. Like yeah. 35, you know, it almost it almost doubled like while we The first had... bit is like public short seller to come out against the thing. Yeah, and that was kind of what it like it 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 wasn't the very start of it, but it kicked it off. It went because then it went from 75 to 200 and then people thought like no way it's going to go higher and then it kept going higher. So it was fun to be uh you know, we were doing our own kind of reporting on it as it happened and then they just seen it happen right yeah. in front of our eyes. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. To be <laughs> we'll send you that. we'll send you the clip in case you want to include part of that footage yeah. in, in the documentary. Yeah. Um so I was looking so on, on your YouTube you have a lot of like motivational videos, some other videos that have gotten millions and millions of views. Um but is this your first video that you're doing about something in the investing world in the stock market world? Yeah and I wouldn't say they're they're motivational. Those those are more kind of um uh, setting the tone for some of the stuff that we want to explore. Um, this is going to be our first documentary focusing around financial markets and financial institutions and structures. So, yeah, I mean, we're storytellers, uh, you know, filmmakers, writers, songwriters. So, like, we are going to be leaning heavily on much smarter people than us in these territories to uh, give us specifics on what's going on in our markets. And then, so, so you mentioned that you, you guys were both involved in, in, in AMC and GameStop buying it. Was, was that your guys' first kind of dive into the financial markets? Have you been investors before that? That's it, man. Like outside of a 401k that I barely look at. But yeah, I mean, I feel like all of the millions of people that invest in these stocks, many of them are doing it for the first time. And it's a total paradigm shift. I mean, it's people taking control of their own financial futures and wealth creation and the amount of education going on for how these systems work and how these people are actually interacting with our markets is pretty incredible. And yeah. we'd like to see more people doing the same thing and voting with their dollar and deciding where their money goes because the retail investor is smart. Uh, they are incredibly knowledgeable and the information is out there for people to make better decisions than a lot of these companies whose uh, motives you might not align with. Yeah, so being able to take your money and saying instead of giving it to a 401k or some uh, institution that's going to manage it for you, all of these people are learning enough to be able to say, hey, maybe I want to decide myself how I want to vote with my dollar. I think this company has good fi uh, fundamentals. I'm gonna go for that. I think this company could do good things for the environment. I'm gonna go for that. Uh, something I hope continues uh, even after this saga is completed. Um, I hope people go out there and, and vote with their dollar and invest in companies they believe in. And then when we saw this saga kind of playing out in real time with, with GameStop and AMC, um, there was a big kind of storyline that it was it was retail investors versus hedge funds, retail investors versus the suits. Um, do you guys see that as like an accurate story? Is that going to be the story that you're depicting in a documentary? Or do I mean, you here's, here's what it is, right? Retail investors did not instigate or create the situation that we find ourselves in. They're not the reason GameStop and stocks like it were shorted well over the float. You know, they're not the reason failure to deliver happen. They're not the reason naked shorting happens. These are normal people who found, who did their own research, found the fundamentals and invested in a stock and a company that they believe in. So this narrative, you know, like the, sure there is rhetoric around those issues saying it's us versus them or whatever. But when we think about that, it's, it's normal people against the people that are keeping us from having transparency and fairness in our markets. There's so much we don't know and we're having to piece together all of this information about what's going on with context and public information, but there's people that know what's going on and we're going to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think as we saw that storyline play out in real time with the, the retail investors versus hedge funds, there were some kind of problems with that story. Um, essentially there were a lot of hedge funds and other invest, you know, institutional investors that were also making a killing off these uh, GameStop and AMC trades. Um, but it was a fun storyline for people to dive into. So I was curious if, if that would be, if that was essentially covered in your documentary, which it sounds like it will be. And there are bad actors. Oh, hundred percent. There yeah. will be a, a part of this film that it focuses on the bad actors. Like that's why we find ourselves in this position, you know? So to some extent, yeah, we will be focusing on that. So as, as someone who's doing like reporting on it, as you guys are, where would you like to see more transparency in, in the, in the markets? in what's going on right now? 
Now, again, for us, like we're filmmakers, so there's there's people that have much better specific answers for exactly the mechanisms that we need more transparency on. But I mean, we're talking about uh, people short positions, failure to the livers, you know, these issues. We want to see more transparency yeah. regarding all of this. But again, we're new, we're newbie investors, right? Like we got into AMC and GME, uh, watched millions of people be stolen from, and wanted to make a film about that. Yeah. So in doing that, there's hours and hours and hours and days of research that we'll be doing, but there's also very smart people that we'll be including within the film to help actually kind of pull yeah. the curtain back and decide what those issues are specifically. Yeah, how we move forward and how we try and have more transparency in our markets and what areas exactly need to be uh, fixed, patched up and, and covered. Um, you know, that's, that's something we're gonna be looking into extensively. You know, we definitely believe that moving forward, there's an opportunity here to make our markets more fair and equitable for everyone involved in them. You know, if, if the SEC and DTCC can have all the information in front of them, if we all, us retail investors had all that information at our fingertips, it'd be a lot easier for us to know what was going on. Uh, but you know, there could be a, a long delay between when it's reported to them, if it's reported to them, and, and when we can see that information. But yeah, we're filmmakers first, and we're gonna have people who are um, involved in this every day at a granular technical level uh, to answer a lot of those questions for us on camera. Are there that's any one of the things that I, I love about the angle that you guys are coming in with is you were a part of the movement. It's not like you were in financial markets for decades before this. And, and that's who the, who this movie is going to be going out for to, to help spread that awareness to, to the mass populace. And I mean, that's, that's like, it, right? Like, we have to be careful when we say movement because these are, no, these are individuals who've done their own research and bought stocks that they like. If there's any kind of movement, it's normal people demanding fairness and transparency in our market. So just to be clear about that. But yeah, that's right. I mean, we're coming from the community out mm -hmm. um, where we don't have people telling us how to tell this story. So the community, I hope, knows that we have no other agenda than to tell the truth, whatever that truth ends up being. And it's long been our thesis at Benzinga that the, 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 the number of retail investors participating in markets, just like myself and, and producer ABU, will increase. It, it's yeah. like the, the internet took off and the stock market lagged behind like two decades, a decade and a half, you know, and, and when finally we see commissions going to zero, account minimums go to zero. I mean, it used to be you needed at least a $10,000 investment to get started. You used to have to call somebody on the phone to place a stock and look at stock prices in the newspaper versus having access on, on a mobile device. So, yeah. Well, there's a danger there too, you know, just like uh, the business models of social media apps where you are commoditized. Um, you know, there could be a, a similar thing happening where, um, companies are posing as having free trading, that sort of thing, but they're making money off of, off of your back. They're lending out your shares and making money off of it and then not giving you any of that money. They're starting you on margin without making it abundantly clear. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that are happening and retail investors um, are being profited off of hand over foot. So it's uh, hand over fist? No, fist. Hand over fist, <laughs> that's the expression. Uh, or feet, whatever, we have to do that. Both. So, yeah. And, and one general filmmaking question I want to ask, because I think a lot of our audience don't know, don't know filmmaking, um, but, but but follow markets. What what's something that that like the the per, like the average person who isn't involved in the filmmaking process would be surprised to hear about how how films are are put together, or or I don't know it, it, anything along those lines. I, I think is really interesting. A lot of it's really boring. I mean, it's like legal stuff, scheduling, production management stuff. Um, more scheduling, a little more scheduling. Yeah, some scheduling after that. After that, some scheduling. <laughs> so, I mean, there's just a lot of like nuts and bolts stuff. It's like starting a small business in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so it's like, I love it. I'm a total nerd for all that good behind the scenes production management stuff. But, you know, like for a documentary like this, you know, we, like, people will say, oh, like, when well, I have to be unbiased. And like, we have a bias. Anyone who says they're going to make a film and says it's unbiased is not being honest with themselves or you. Right, so we'll have our bias, um, but we're gonna back it up, or what's the story we're telling with facts. We're gonna tell the truth and do our best to at least be aware of our own bias when we're telling the yeah. story. And to be unafraid of discovering things that may not um, be what we want to discover. You know, we're gonna present the facts as we find them as best we can, but yeah, it's exactly right. Everyone has bias and it's, it's a film. And our, the main thing that we just, is so, like, one thing that's really important to us is this you know narrative uh, that we want to set the record straight on that um, I don't even want to say it for fear of it being used, but we're telling a story about people that are working 
on their own to make financial decisions, right? Like they're not doing anything nefarious or, or weird here. Like you guys on this show talk about car parts, fundamentals, stuff that you like, you crowdsource, you ask more people for their opinions on it. You called out your own positions at one point, publicly disclosed losses. Like th these are okay things, right? Like Gary Gensler himself says that we all have free speech and a right to say to a neighbor, right? Whether it's online or in person, I like this investment. Places like uh, Super Stonk, is a, is they're, we're finding creative places to go and share information about a stock that we like, nothing more. This isn't any worse or any better. In fact, in many ways it is better because we actually, most of the time you get disparaged for sharing your positions, but either way, <laughs> yeah. not, there's nothing nefarious going on here. These are separate people buying and holding a stock in a company they like and the way that they've been portrayed by the mass media is abhorrent and we wanna try to correct that while digging into the mechanics and illegality that has led to the situation we found ourselves in yeah. that retail is simply reacting to did not, not create not only are they getting into these uh, you know uh, the research that's being done in these spaces is incredible it's amazing you know we have people every day posting really interesting dd and if it's due diligence and if it's found to be incorrect people will eventually call them out or correct it. It's a uh, public source. Yeah, it's publicly sourced and it's it's really incredible how much information these people are bringing up and having peer reviewed by, you know, people like David Lauer. Yeah, Austin Tobit or A Tobit on Reddit posted his House of Cards trilogy is this great due diligence report. And we got, it was peer reviewed by uh, David Lauer, Dr. Suzanne Trimbath. Like they're also, these, these public spaces are getting better at what they're doing and all of the people who have been a part of this from the start have seen how they're portrayed and they're fleeing mass media and they're going to these online meeting places like Trey's channel for AMC or Superstock for, for GameStop. It's, it's an incredible paradigm shift. We're lucky to be a part of it and we want to scream from the rooftops about what's really going on. Awesome. And you guys are, are giving the crowd uh, the opportunity to actually help support the film um, can, can you tell us a little bit about that and how folks can get involved? Yeah, there's a couple ways you can get involved, a couple ways, I should say. Uh, you can either submit a video of yourself explaining why you got into uh, AMC or GME, uh, what are the reasons behind it. You know, uh, We want to include as many of these folks in the film as possible. It's a big, big important factor to us to have people involved in the making of a film uh, about us, about our community. Um, and would they do that with the submit your story link on the website? Correct. Yeah. And then if you want okay. to support the film, um, you know, we are crowdfunding it as well. Um, so you can go to that link there. Thank you for showing it. Um, and you can submit at different levels for different rewards, much like a uh, GoFundMe or Kickstarter. Yeah. I mean, it's important to us. Links are in the chat. Awesome. Thank you. Hell yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks for the thank you all. Well, do you guys have a, a date in mind that this is, is being released? Uh, we are hoping to wrap by the end of the year. Uh, we don't have a release date as of yet, but that'll come. Got it. And then I have a one final question. Are there, are there have, have you noticed any benefits in this process um, in the fact that you are newer, in, that you were involved, like you got involved in investing through this, that you aren't weren't in financial markets for 10 years before making this video? Yeah. I mean, honestly, we don't have the the baggage of kind of the old way of doing things more or less. I mean, there's an argument you said that there's a new type of investor out there and they are, you know, they have morality. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's Bulls, fascinating. Bears and apes. And apes, right? <laughs> like I have this image of an ape uh, riding on the Wall Street bull with a bear rearing back. You know, it's it's great. Um, so we, I think it's, it's awesome the time to get into this. And what we hope to see is that generations of people will learn about markets and financial literacy will become a real priority because that is how we can redistribute wealth is by teaching people who weren't given a chance to learn before about how all of this works. And through that and through public discourse, we will absolutely have a better future for everyone in participating if we can demand transparency and fairness in our markets. Well, thank you for thank you for doing that. I mean, I think it's awesome. I can't wait to watch the final product once it's out there. And yeah, I, I mean, it, it's just been a fascinating story to to like be involved in. Um, and we're, you know, Luke and I are doing this every single day where we're watching the market, seeing what's going on. So sometimes it's good to be able to take a step back and like look at what really happened, which I'm hoping to be able to do with your your movie. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thanks you, a lot. You get really granular with it and watch every tiny detail and move. But 
if you step back once in a while and try and look at the bigger picture, it becomes pretty clear there's some pieces that are broken. So we are in a, a real moment here in history, and we're incredibly excited to be capturing it in real time. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us today on the Power Hour. We hope to you know, have you all back on anytime there's updates about this film or, or maybe you know any subsequent things that you guys are working on in the financial markets. We'd love to have you back on. Um, and if you find anything super interesting while doing your research on this, let us know. Uh, maybe we can break some stories together or something. Hey, yeah, I remember the price is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Awesome, right, guys. guys thank so you, much. everybody. Links are in the chat. Check them out. Mulligan Brothers joining us on the Power Hour. Awesome to have you guys on with us. Thank you. <laughs> Boom. How about that one, Producer AB? That deserves an answer. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty fun. I mean, not our typical interview, um, but, you know, very interesting nonetheless. And I'm excited for the movie. I think I am hoping that Power Hour, we get a little cameo in there when we get left on there. What do you think? I, I it would be pretty cool. It would be pretty cool. Maybe we and what J Jason was about to talk through a stock. Do you remember which one it was? It was Generac G E N R. All right. That, that's where Generac, we left it off at. I think. I don't know if he's still out there and wants to come on. Uh, but but Generac was the oh, ticker. Oh, GRNC, sorry. GR, yeah. The, wait. Yeah, it's, uh, you GNRC, know. GNRC, yeah. It backs up, you know, uh, your power. If your power goes out when there's storms. So now they're saying, you know, uh, the next storm's coming up right now in Florida. So there you go. GNRC is right there. Um, so people are buying it. It was down at 240, 260. I've owned it since the beginning of Corona when I was like at the low it's one of the ones i held on to unlike some of the other one other ones like uh big five sporting goods that i bought at 180 and sold at 250 and now it's at 25 but generic was one of the ones i kept didn't keep all of it but i kept most of it um i also kept most of wendy's too um i sold a little bit of that when we had you know when it was pictured as a reddit stock um yeah, and I also mentioned Voyager. It's staying Voyager stay, V Y G V F. It's staying around uh, you know, 16, 16, 1650. So I like that there's support there. Um you know, I like that there's support. Um and I like that it hasn't fallen back to 15, 14 level. Um it'll be interesting to see what they announce new. Um one thing that I did notice is BlockFi lowered its you its stable coin rates. Uh, whereas um, Voyager didn't, so I'm still getting nine percent on my USDC through Voyager. Very, you know, I'm happy with that. So I don't know if that cuts into margins or if that's just going to keep people people moving more accounts there because that that was good. Um, I did not get rid of my Caesars CZR. I still own Caesars. I still own um, um, and I still own Win. Um, up a little bit on them and or just like it's it's fractional. Um, I still think the Vegas plays are there. Um, that is, you know, it's, it's going to be, um, what does it say? W's went private this weekend. It's going to be a lot harder for people to find those high flying meme stocks until a new form is created for the public or they back. Well, if we could find some developers, you can build a, a Reddit th thread on Benzinga, you know? Yeah. Maybe trade ideas will become the new wall street bets. Um, all right, Jason, we do have our next guest up. Uh, coming from in the money stocks. I'm excited there. Hopefully, uh, Garrett's going to come with some big trade ideas. Do you have any other tickers we want to talk about real quick before we bring Gareth on? No, nope. You go. Take it. Take it, dude. Let's do it. <laughs> Gareth, how are we doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so Gareth is joining us from InTheMoneyStocks.com. Um, can you give our audience some background on, on the website real quick? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, a little background on me. Um, I grew up in a middle class family. Um, my parents never invested ever. Um, in high school, I did like one of those investment club types things. And it was just in the late 90s when the dot coms were going insane, which is very reminiscent of what we've seen in AMC and GameStop. You know, it's it's that same kind of craziness. And, it, you know, even though it was a fake account back then, I was just so amazed that my fake account could double and triple in size so easily. And it, it became addicting, frankly. And it was something where I said, this is something I have to do as a career. Um, you know, obviously, I would find out later on it wasn't that easy, obviously. Um, but 
but that's where I went and, and I just continued. And then in 2007, we launched in the money stocks.com. I launched it with a business partner and we came up with this methodology where we really analyze the charts in a specific way. And it kind of gives us at least the probabilities pretty nicely in our favor. So that's where we've come from. We've been around for a long time and it's been a great ride. Wow. Yeah. So do you, outside of just the crazy price action and the movement in the stocks, what, what similarities do you see between what we're, what's going on right now and maybe what we saw in the early 2000s? Yeah. So, so some of the things, so the price movement, obviously, I still remember, you know, penny stocks back in the late nineties, I would buy at two cents. The next day it would be eight cents. Then it would be 50 cents. And then it'd be a dollar uh, in, in a matter of a week too, which is just incredible back then. But also some of the other concerning things for me are, are the margin deficit level. So you have investors borrowing a lot of money um, to buy stocks. They're over leveraged essentially. And that creates a scenario that if any little hiccup comes in the market, you could see a mass deleveraging event where stocks really get crushed. I mean, it could be a flash crash type scenario or a longer drawn out situation. So those type of things are a concern. Insider selling is a concern to me. Uh, the insiders are just loving these markets at all time highs that keep grinding higher. They're dumping at record levels here. Uh, so many signals like that just have me on edge. I don't trust the markets right now at all. Okay. I mean, that's good to know. I mean, we see some um, you know, kind of hesitance and in, in, in understanding what's going on in the market. Some people are, are either super bullish or super bearish, but it sounds like you're kind of wanting to just hang out on the sidelines, see, see what, what things are doing. Um, I agree. I mean, insider buying, it's something that I love to look at in a company. If I, if I already like a company and then I see that they have a lot of, you know, insider buying, then that's a great sign for me to get in. And obviously on the flip side, insider selling is like a big, no, no, I want out of that company if we see a lot of insider selling. Yeah. Um, do you have any companies off the top of your head where you've seen some of this insider selling pick up? I mean, I mean, believe it or not, in some of the meme stocks, you've had some of the insider selling pick up and you can't blame them. I mean, they're seeing their stocks go up hundreds, if not thousands of percentage points. Um, you've even seen some, some selling pressure from institutional side in many of the big name stocks across the board, whether it's Apple or other names like that. You know, a lot of institutions are now starting to put themselves even on the short side of the market or more in cash just as we get to these lofty levels. And I think it's based off the fact that you have a market that hasn't had a major correction in years. Uh, we haven't had a recession, a big recession anyway, since 2008, 2009. And we all know, or at least most people should know that the Fed is getting to the point where you're going to remove, they're going to start removing liquidity. They're going to start raising interest rates. Inflation is starting to bubble up. These are all things that historically have been a negative for the market. And, and the, the big institutions are starting to position themselves accordingly. So wait, you, you said we haven't had a big correction in year. Are you not counting the, the COVID crash? Yeah. I mean, so to me, that's more of an outlier where it was a specific event. It wasn't, you know, you didn't see the economy curtailing and slowing prior to that. It was more all of a sudden, oh my goodness, look at this explosive pandemic that's hitting hitting things. So so to me, that's not a real a real economic recession. It was caused by a virus, obviously. And um and so it doesn't kind of go into the same you can't really say like, oh well that's that means that was a down cycle in the markets. It's more like you still have to go through the normal ups and downs of cycles. And remember, the government came out and literally spent trillions of dollars. The Fed continues to be the biggest buyer of our treasuries, which to me, that's, this is insane, right? So you have the Fed, the biggest buyer of the U.S. debt is the, is the, the Federal Reserve. And they were doing this because we were in a catastrophic situation, which I understand. But now you have a scenario where the economy is just exploding with growth and they're still doing it. I mean, it, it's, it's beyond me why they would continue to have these, these policies intact when we're doing relatively well in terms of growth. So- yeah. So I hear you on the COVID, you know, you're looking at it as like a black swan event and yeah. not something that was a true market correction just based on the economy. Um, and yeah, I remember that when, when we saw this initial sell-off happening here back in February and March, I remember there was one day in particular where they announced the Fed was buying, you know, 500 million or $500 billion worth of assets or something. And there was like the tiniest little bit of a green candle and then boom, just back down to in the downtrend that we saw. And it was like, they announced they were buying all that money just for one little, you know, for 10 minutes, the, the spy like leveled out and then continue to drop. Yeah. Um, that's, and that's what happens so often is that during bear market periods where there's all out panic, you see that selling just 
insatiable. Just like on the buy side, you could argue that, you know, investors are just looking to put more and more money in the market. And, and I always come back to kind of the thought process of being logical. Like there's always the greed side and there's always the fear side to the market. The best investors are the wor of, in the world are going to be the ones that just kind of keep an even keel and look at the facts, right? They don't get caught up in the momentum. They don't get caught up in that greed. And they say, okay, well, you know, if, if the world were to go into catastrophic, you know, collapse tomorrow, is there real value here in, in this stock? And I think that's what investors should be asking themselves. And there are stocks out there that do have value. Um, there's a lot of stocks out there that are way overvalued too. So, yeah, I mean, I was just going to ask, so I assume even though you're, you know, you're hesitant on the market right now, um, you have your site. I imagine you're not just, you know, you, you still are putting out trade ideas, correct? You're not just saying sit back on the sideline for everyone, right? Yeah, correct. And in fact, in fact, I, I'm short the indices now. So, so I'm short uh, the Nasdaq 100. I'm short the S and P here. Uh, I'm short the Russell. The Russell's actually having a nice little drop today as well with the S and P. So there are the beauty of of what I do is which is more swing trading, which is is shorter term trading. And so I'm in a stock for a week or a few days or a month. Is that we just try to play the moves up and down, and we find that we can make more money by playing the pop up and then a retrace as well rather than just holding a stock for 20 years where you might make, you know, a 500%, but if you swing trade it intra period, you can actually double or triple your returns. So yeah, there's absolutely trading opportunities, both on the long side here, as well as on the short side. Okay. Well, do we have any, you know, particular outside of the indices, any particular name stocks you're looking at that you think might be undervalued, overvalued? Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's touch base on a couple of these. Like Alibaba to me is one that I, I've accumulated today. Um, this is getting caught up in the, the Chinese regulation and kind of push to kind of uh, hamper, you know, whether it's investment from abroad or whatnot. We see the crackdown on Diddy on Friday where they basically said, hey, you guys aren't being transparent enough for what the government wants. We want to have more access. And so the Chinese stocks have really gotten hammered here. And you can see some good supports right in this lower range. Um, and it's a stock that if you look at the value, the, the price to earnings ratio is actually very low because of this extra risk from China. My thesis is that eventually, basically China's just flexing their muscles, right? I, I've used this, this analogy before, but it's like I have a three and a half year old, four year old, right? And she'll get a little, she'll get away with a little bit more and a little bit more and I'll, I'll let it pass. I'll let it pass. But eventually you have to put your foot down and say, okay, you know, we can't do this anymore. That's what the Chinese government is doing right now. They're putting their foot down to kind of rein in the craziness. They don't want to hurt their golden children being Alibaba, Baidu, and some of these other companies. Um, they still want them to be the proud you know, representation of China. So they will step away once these companies kind of come back in line and let that growth resume. So I think you know names like the Chinese stocks, even though they're beaten down, that's when you want to buy them. You don't want to buy them at all-time highs. You want to buy them when there's, there's a lot of pressure on them. Yep, we were we were talking about Baba earlier today too, and we kind of uh, Luke, who was on the show earlier, was saying he sees it as as the premier Chinese stock right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, it looks like a great buying opportunity. We saw it all the way up here at almost three hundred and twenty dollars back in October of last year, all the way down at two ten right now. Um, definitely have my eye on that one. Uh, any any other ones? Uh, any other Chinese stocks in particular? I know you mentioned what Baidu or Baidu. BIDU is an interesting one. Um, and, and then there's, there's a bunch. I mean, YY is a good one, which is Joy. That's gotten just, I mean, that stock was trading at $150. It's now right around $62. Um, and I love trends. So so people look at a chart like that, right? And they're like, oh my goodness, it's, it's a falling knife. It's in such a steep downtrend. I look at charts like that and say, okay, What's the reasoning behind it? Okay, it's nothing specific to the company. Okay, that's a good thing, right? So it's not like they're going out of business or anything like that. And then I look at the chart and I try to find some support. And there's a ton of support right around 62 as well. And I say, okay, oversold into technical support. Fear and panic are driving it lower. And a lot of these stocks lower, they're due for a bounce. And again, if you look at RSI, it's way to the downside. The RSI indicators are way oversold. These are the types of things that get me to say, okay, I might be able to get 10% to the upside in a week on this name, and I'm not going to marry it. I'm not going to hold it for the next 20 years, but if I can get 10% in a week, I'm all about that type of set setup. Yeah, if you get 10% in a week and you do that for 52 weeks, you're looking at 520% over the year. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're looking at both. You're looking at both the technical aspects of the chart, you know, the RSI, the Relative Strength Index, 
as well as looking at like what the company's doing. Is there news that's driving this stock um, all the way down? So is, is that, would you say it's accurate? Yeah, very accurate. So, so again, you know, for instance, if a drug stock says, Hey, our biggest drug candidate failed its trials. I mean, obviously you may want to step back and not invest in that because, because their, their biggest potential growth driver for the future is gone. But in, in the case of a lot of these Chinese stocks, the decline started with that Archegos capital collapse back, you know, I think that was in February or March. And then the selling has just continued as the government has come back, come out here and just kind of piled on. And to me, I look at it and I say, OK, so you have U.S. stocks like NVIDIA and, and these other names like Google and, and Amazon hitting all time highs. Their valuations are getting stretched. And I look at a valuation on a YY or a, a BABA and I say, OK, these things are way off of their highs. They're kind of it's more like going to the going to the mall and being like, all right, I'll buy these great pair of jeans. They're 50 percent off right now versus, you know, I'm never going to go to the, the mall and say, oh, yippee, those jeans could just got marked up to two hundred dollars from one hundred. I'm going to go buy those. Right. We always want to have that mentality of, is this on sale? And if it is, then I'm a buyer. Right. And I think the whole story right now that we're seeing with China stocks, I mean, it's pretty interesting. I, I made the point earlier. I don't think I articulated it very well, but just the, the fact that um, it, it seems at least like the Chinese regulatory process is working, right? They find discrepancies in DD's financials or whatever it is, and they crack down on it. They want to see what's going on. And, you know, it's like you, the analogy you gave with your your uh, child, too. It's like they have they crack down. They, they are flexing their power. But is that better or worse? And if they just let these companies run amok and, and pull a luck and coffee or whatever and report numbers for however many years that are inaccurate. Right. Um, it's just like, to be honest, it's just like what you want to see in Bitcoin, right? So so we hear about regulation for Bitcoin and how scary it is. And every time you see regulation mentioned with Bitcoin, people freak out. But in the long term, it's actually a good thing. You want things to be transparent. You want them to be open and honest. And the same thing goes with Chinese companies. In fact, I think it's a positive longer term for the Chinese companies to have the government more forcing them to report things in certain ways. In fact, I think it was a couple months ago, the U.S. administration came out and said, hey, listen, we want Chinese companies to report their data in terms of the way the U.S. companies do. So the transparency is there. So this might actually be a, a track that the Chinese government's starting to go on to actually open up and become more compliant with what the U.S. is asking in terms of, of investors. Yeah, I mean, I agree 100%. And it also kind of shows that um, the government is able to to regulate the companies over there, not the other way around, where it's essentially companies controlling what the government is doing. Um, right. All right, Gareth. Well, we I do got to wrap up here, but if there's any other trade ideas or any other thing you want to um, talk about, I'm going to throw the link to the website in the chat in case we have any viewers that want to go check it out, which I strongly recommend that you do. Um, that's in the money stocks.com. I have your Twitter up here too, Gareth. Is it Soloway or Soloway? Soloway, yeah. Soloway. Yeah, I want to make sure yeah my Twitter is just at Gareth Soloway, first name, last name. Awesome. Yep. And then and then the only other stock that I like right now, I mean, there's a few, but but like a Viacom, I think that's one you just want to keep an eye on. I think it's retracing after a short-term breakout, um, low PE with potential for being a buyout candidate with all the mergers going on in streaming right now. So so take a look at that one too. That's one of my favorites. I just picked that up today as well. Was this involved in the Archegos? Is it, well, is this part of that big... Yep. Uh, falling knife. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. That's what I and thought. That, I mean, that was just, it should have never been up at a hundred plus, but it, it, it down here to me, it looks very attractive down here, especially if you look like a nine forward PE, very low. And again, you Ooh. know, could Comcast be a buyer could, you know, there's, there's, they're going to have to, you know, see, see who's out there that's interested, but there could be a buyer there. Yeah. And I love right now, I love in streaming. I love the live sports play because live sports is one of the only things you know, along with like presidential debates and things like that, one of the only things that people will watch live. Yep. So the, the advertisements for that become worth a lot more than say you're watching reruns on Netflix or whatever. And Viacom has some good live sporting, uh, including the the Champions League, uh, which is huge internationally. Um, and, and I've said it before, I'll say it again. I like seeing a stock kind of trading sideways like this for a little bit. I like that consolidation. And that's to me, a lot of times where I like to get in is when I see this bottom forming and I'm yeah, looking for a nice potential rounded bottom right there. And again, you'd like to see it hold. There's, it's right around the 50, 20 moving averages on the daily. I'd like to see it hold right around this 42 level and then start to move back up. Yeah. Yep. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Gareth. I love the rounding bottoms here. Um, all right. Well, we'd love to have you back on the show again. Uh, sorry, we have to cut it a little short today. But anytime you have some trade ideas, you know, hop on the show. We like to just have fun, throw out some trade ideas. 
And, and yeah, that's really the gist of the show. Awesome. I love it. Thank you so much for having me on. And, and I hope to be back soon. All right, Gareth. Yep. I'll reach out and we'll get you back on. Awesome. All right. That was Gareth from In The Money Stock. Some good market insight there. Um, and what I'm going to do is bring on my very good friend, Spencer. I, I don't think that that qualifies as breaking news, but 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 thank you. And and also, I where was that conversation a couple of hours ago? Because I was talking this morning how I wanted to uh, sell my K Web, which I did end up selling today. It was a long term position of mine. Is that a Chinese company? It's a internet uh, internet ETF, Chinese internet ETF. K Web, K Web, C K W E. Oh, I thought you said K Web. K Web and my. Series. So you're saying you sold it, but you wouldn't have if you heard him talking. No, not necessarily, but here, let me pull up a, pull up a long-term chart of this thing. So so I had this thing on like for, from like 48. It did nothing for a few years, right? I had this thing from like 48 um, and just sold it today at like 63. So, I wonder, Spencer, we'll have to do some some digging in, in the ETFdatabase.com, but if you pull up CQQQ, Mm -hmm. yeah, they're very similar. I was going to say, I'm sure the holdings are very similar. Both, yeah, they are. You know, Chinese technology companies. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to let you get to it. I know we got a special guest coming yeah. out. We're going to break down some IPOs. Yes. Yeah. We have Matt Hammond coming on and I want to get to Matt because there's a lot to talk about. So AB, go look at your Slack because there's a bunch of Slack messages that, that, that are that are directed to you. Uh oh, that, that doesn't sound good. Nothing bad, but just they require your attention. So go look at Slack, my man. I'll talk to you later. All right. Sounds All right. good. All right, guys. It was a busy, busy week on the IPO front. And uh, to help us understand all of it, normally we have Matt Hammond on the show Mondays at 9 o'clock. But obviously, Monday was a holiday. No, no shows. Uh, so Matt Hammond is going to join us today. And uh, man, what a crazy week it was for IPOs, right? We had legal Zoom. We had Krispy Kreme. Uh, just a lot to get to. Uh, the, the whole DD thing is crazy, right? So let's bring on Matt Hammond now from IPO Warriors. Matt, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Spencer? Doing well, doing well. Hope you enjoyed the nice long weekend. There's so much to talk about today, man. I don't even know where to start. Um, I'd like to touch base with something quickly that you discussed earlier today, which was kind of getting out of some of your Chinese positions. Yeah. Um, and the reason I feel a little bit uniquely... Uh, position to talk about this is because I lived in China for about 11 years. So okay. I can tell you that if you're trying to approach anything that you understand about the Chinese government from your perspective as an American with the American relation to government, you're, 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 you're so far off that you don't even know that you're playing a completely different game. <laughs> uh, the Chinese government has total, ultimate, complete control over everything. And they saw that these technological elite, starting with Jack Ma, were getting out of hand and they are slapping them down. And if you think that China cares at all about our markets or our regulations or our security system, you're also playing, you're, you're, you're absolutely, you think you're playing golf by the rules and they are sneaking golf balls out of your bag, putting them in the hole when you're not looking. <laughs> discounting their strokes. You're not playing the same game. I also got a, I out, I got out of Baba last week. I got oh, out of 10 okay. cents a day. These are positions I bought in, you know, three, four years ago. Yeah. I, I have just as much belief that China is sending out a very clear signal that they want their companies listing on their exchanges and they're going to do what they can to punish companies that are listing in America. I've heard okay. from people who are in finance in China that are saying, Look, you guys, can, it's nothing about regulation. dd has been around for 10 years. I used it all the time when I lived there. Yeah. They don't care. This isn't about security. This isn't about anything. They wanted DD to list in China, and they are pissed that DD listed in America. And this is revenge. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was thinking back, you know, it's, you always want to remember why you bought something. I was thinking back to why I bought KWeb in the first place, and it was very, very simple, right? China is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, uh, largest population, and you want to pick the cream of the crop. And KWeb had all the biggest players, the, the cream of the crop, right? Baidu, JD, Baba, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why wouldn't I want exposure to an internet play in uh, a country where the internet is is arguably has more dominant over culture than than in, in the U.S., but then you get this this thing happening where, to your point, Matt, it's like the government can do what they want when they want, and um, I just 
don't want any part of it. So, uh, and it, it's, it's a little a little bit sad for me because it was like a, you know, you know, you shouldn't grow attached to your positions. But this is a longer term holding of mine, and you know, I was excited about it for a while, and you know, now now I'm not as excited anymore. So, you know, I felt exactly the same way about Ten Cent. Yeah. Um, I had been in that from the first time I bought. You know, bananas from a street vendor. You know, yeah. with WeChat, uh, which is right. Ten Cent's big app, and it was just like, oh, aha! And I bought it, and it felt just felt like compared to Facebook and Google, that it yeah. should have gone way, way higher. But people in America don't, you know, think it's a video game company. Mm-hmm. Um, the reality is, there's too much downside potential uh, with China. I think that this is just the start of a bunch of crackdowns, or maybe it's not. But I'm not going to get involved in anything <laughs> Chinese right yeah. now. Yeah. And, uh, I would rather have my money. Right, well, I, I'm glad to see that you agree with me because I'm, you know, after that last conversation, I was doubting myself, but I feel a little bit better about that now. It's just one last thing I got to worry about. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about IPOs, Matt. Sure. Uh, we we uh, yeah. I don't know historically how busy of a time you know July is on the IPO slate. I would imagine it's historically not that busy, but last week was a very busy week for IPOs. S- and uh, let's recap what what happened last week, and then uh, we can talk about it. Sure, there's so many that um, I'm going to start with the clear winners, and if people want to bring up some of the other ones, we can kind of review what happened. Uh, some of it was appeared to be people wanting to get their IPOs onto the calendar before the end of the quarter or before yeah. the holiday. Okay, that was the. I mean, just the past two weeks have been the busiest two weeks I've ever had in IPO land, and I made it killing last week on some of these Tell us all and that. it's one of the best best weeks i've had um, and they're not necessarily the ones that you would expect uh, but we also should pat our backs for uh missing some of the bad ones um but there was a lot to learn from the week uh ding dong mai tai speaking of uh chinese ipos this one pulled a surprising reverso Zometry, clear secure crispy cream pop culture and the glimpse group the low float IPO was just on. I mean, you see pop culture. This is one of those stealth IPOs. It wasn't on the calendar on Monday. I had mentioned this a month or two ago, and I sent out an alert to the news uh, to the newsletter group. You can sign up at IPOWarriors.com. I sent out an alert the day before and said, hey, guys, watch out for this one. It's Network One Solutions or Network One Financial. I put a pretty big position on this, made a good chunk of money. Um, we'll get to that one in a second. Uh, Ding Dong Mai Tsai. This was a uh, like grocery delivery, uh, did really badly on day one, probably in response to MF uh, doing really badly, Miss Fresh the week before, dropped down to 2270, and then the low float kicked on day two, and it just ripped from 23 up to 45. Almost no way to see this coming. What this does kind of reinforces my belief that if, once I'm in an IPO play, I don't want to take losses on day one because you never w- know what's going to happen in this day two, you know, overnight media, media cycle. And, you know, there's no reason to take a loss when there's a good chance that you're going to get a win, uh, you know, or th- there's a reasonable chance that you'll get an out on day two. Wait, wait, wait hold on. So wait, what would have happened in that scenario um, if, if on day two, you know, this stock opened at like, you know, 23, 22 and just went lower from there. At some point you do have to cut bait. Um, this one I didn't play to begin with. So it's uh, hard to tell oh, what I would do. Okay. Right, um, so. But I'll give you an example here. Sentinel. Um, I bought yeah. Sentinel security and it finally went in the green today. Um, and that was more like a three day run, but I had more you know conviction in that play. And this is where you don't really want to just, I don't just throw my hat in the ring on every IPO and say, oh, let's see what it does. I'm trying to make a case for why I think a stock will go up. And if it doesn't go up, uh, that that is going to affect my exit strategy. I ended up holding MF uh, longer than day one, day two, and getting out for you know a loss. Um, but I waited for it to come up just a little bit and then exited and rolled it right into one of these trades this week that made a lot of money. So... My point is a lot of people will, because they're used to day trading and they set their stop loss, end up getting stopped out of losses almost you know every time when there's later a win just right around the corner, thinking that it's going to trade like a stock that's been trading for months or years. Whereas these IPOs, they don't really know what the price is. And there's very good chance that if you had a reason to believe it was a good play at the beginning, that it's going to come back 
Um, and we'll get to, I do want to review DD because that was one that we very clearly said, don't get in this on the debut. And that one you'd just be stuck in right now. Uh, it's only gotten worse. Um, but I like these, you know, more often than not, we get a chance to get out uh, in, you know, for a profit, even when we see dips on day one. And it's hard, especially if it's one of your first IPO plays, you know, and there are certainly examples, Coinbase never turned around, although that was a direct listing. Um, more often than not, we do see uh, the opportunity to take a win if you stay in it for a little while. Uh, usually within the first two or three days, we'll at least see some opportunity to come out at a better position than just, you know, down here at 2270 or 23 saying, oh man, I thought this was going to be a good one. I had such a, you know, just 3 million shares or whatever. How could it, you know, do that badly? Well, day two, people, other people woke up and said, hey, this does have a little float. This is actually a, you know, an interesting company. And this was before the DD uh, disaster. And you know, it just ripped into halts until you would have been kicking yourself if you sold out on a stop loss down here, down here, and then saw this opportunity later on. Another big win opportunity from last week was Zometry. This was getting a bit of buzz in Twitter. It also had a pretty low float. I think it was 6 million shares. It opened up at 66.55, made a steady climb to 97.57. Um, this is one where once it debuts at almost 100% of the IPO price and then runs up another 50% from there, I wouldn't be holding it into day two. You've already, I'm not saying hold it into day two when you've taken profits all the time, but you know, when you're on a, in any kind of play like this, taking profits with the raising stop loss at any point you know, along the way is, uh, is a winning trade. This one su surprised me a little bit, but I did have it on a sort of <clears throat> chatted out to my Reddit thread uh, where we're live trading this. I said, uh, too many other plays for today, but this one, I have a suspicion this one turns, you know, turns out to be a good one. And it was the brand recognition, a relatively low float, 10 million sh uh, shares. And it was getting a lot of buzz on Twitter. People have seen this at the airports. People were calling it a reopening trade. Uh, it opened up at 38866. I didn't have enough conviction to play this in the first place, but if I had, I certainly would have been taking profits pretty early. If you really loved this company and you had a high conviction, you know, give it that overnight media cycle. There's uh, always going to be lots of articles written about an IPO saying, you know, this one, uh, did 50%, you know, because they count the IPO price, not the debut price. You know, the articles uh, that's, will say, a great, that's a great point, man. Every article I read, I read about IPOs is uh, in blank IPO pops on, on first date. Well, yeah, they always pop from the IPO, well, not always, 99% of the IPOs will pop from the IPO price, but trade lower from the opening price, right? So, that's a Especially great the brand name. Like that's a great, great point you mentioned. We always talk on pre market Hub about the two day move, right? There's there's the mm -hmm. first day, and then there's the second day when everybody read about it on the first day, right? Uh, exactly. Or read about, it, read about it overnight. So what you're saying there is the exact same principle. It's the two day move. Um, never underestimate what an overnight media cycle can do. And that's where, you know, you'll see the debut price above the IPO price sometimes, and it drops below the debut price, which if you're just a retail trader buying in off the debut who didn't get the IPO price, you know, you're feeling like, wait, I'm down like two or three dollars per share. And then the articles come out and they're like, you know, XXX stock jumps 30 percent on IPO. And you feel a little bit like that's misleading. But people who didn't you know, who weren't aware of it overnight go, oh, that company, they're going to be strong. And that's, again, why I don't like to take losses on day one. If I have to take a day lo a loss on day two or later, okay. But so many times you see something just run on day two, like this one did, because my guess is a lot of people who read that article, uh, you know, the buyers or the immediate sellers had already, you know, taken their profits and gone. There weren't many left of them. And you know now you've got a, a nice run. It's come back down since then, but uh, you know you had a nice nice trade here if you had a high conviction in Clear Secure. Okay, one of the big names last week was Krispy Kreme. Um, there was everything you'd ask for in terms of a sort of easy IPO to play, in my opinion. Even a debut below the IPO price wouldn't you know phase me in this in the sense that. 
there was high brand recognition. If you haven't heard of Krispy Kreme, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, had a lot of hype. People loved the uh, the ticker symbol. The float was 26 million shares. I guess they upped it a little bit, but it was still under 30 million shares. Uh, opened up at 1630. If it opens up around there, I'm, I'm thinking 20, you know, get out right before 20. You don't really know once it starts doing this into 20, if it's just going to drop off that. Um, but it made a pretty, I mean, you just, you couldn't have taken a loss if you bought this on the debut. Uh, just made this super easy. Get in, take your profits, you know, go get some donuts and uh, enjoy your weekend. This was a, a Friday. Uh, this was a surprising one for me. I kind of, and maybe I was wrong for thinking this, but I, it seemed like it had like first day drop written all over it. Like, cause it had all this hype for what? For a donut store? Like, well, they so own on, insomnia cookie cookies, which is incredibly profitable. Uh, they have posted some pretty large growth numbers and they just, they, they are raising money to refinance debt on money that they had invested into restructuring their entire business more than anything. It was just, I love donuts. I want the nut, you know? And I think a lot of people just decided that that was going to be a fun one to buy and to own. And uh, when, especially when we saw the initial price range was 21 to $24, that was the, you know, the indication price uh, in the prospectus before. And they decided to reduce the price to 17 and in instead increase the share count a little bit, uh, not enough to offset. I think the initial IPO, valuation estimates were 650 million. They reduced it down to about 500 million. It was almost like they were gift wrapping it for retail investors not to experience a uh, dip on the buy. And when you see all those factors come into play, plus the just the brand recognition, it makes this one stand out as one that, hey, uh, everyone in their, you know, when, when we've seen high brand recognition without a ridiculous float, uh, these, these have done well. So, uh, I actually got an finally got an E-Trade allocation on this one, which is of course at seventeen dollars. But um, you know, I'll be holding this until for the thirty days just to improve my IPO score, I guess, so that maybe in the future they'll give me better <laughs> stocks. <laughs> they also gave me DD, so go figure. Gladly, gladly they didn't give me a full allocation on that one. <laughs> my first two, my first two were DD and D nut. Okay. Oh boy. Um, so now we can talk a little bit about the stealth IPOs and we've spent some yeah. time talking about these before. Uh, these are really fun. They're super low float. They generally get no publication. They're even not listed on most of the IPO calendars kind of to do a little digging. This one was on my radar for a while. We talked about this one along with one that still hasn't gone live yet. That's G sun. We talked about this about a month ago when I think EJH, debuted and these have kind of a you know a, a fingerprint i mean these do have uh, some sort of hints that allow us to key in on them before they they go live one is often they are kind of random chinese companies pop culture does hip-hop events you know in china uh, the other is their underwriters tend to be Bosted Securities and Network One Financial and Sutter Financial. These companies seem to be doing something a little tricky with the um, with the IPOs. A little bit of a you know rug pull if you hold these too long. But the trick is you're really looking for these initial halts. I wanted to show the full you know opportunity here, which you're insane if you somehow held your whole position this whole time. Um, but these initial halts right here, we got three or four halts straight up. And if you're in at 1226 and this topped here at 33, you know, you can look at the level two data. You can see whether there's orders or not uh, in place above the, the halt price. And you're trying to time, you know, after maybe the after this one, I think we got to hold through about the third halt. And then we got out like 24, 25. Some people were able to get out at 30. But that's a great play. I mean, to get in at 1226 on a play that you're pretty confident in and you can buy, you know, a thousand shares or a hundred shares, whatever you're kind of, I was able to sort of max out what I was playing this on because I was so confident that this was going to do this initial run up. And then, you know, if you want to, you can hold 20%, 30% into a day two run. 
Uh, but you're really going to be better off trying to play that if you have a Webull account because these peaks are early pre-market. These are, you know, 6 p.m. Uh, again, I think this one was 5, 5 p or sorry, 6 a.m., 5 a.m., and E-Trade and Robinhood, I mean, you're just not going to be able to place orders to get out on those peaks. But with Webull, uh, you know, not high volume, but you can you can take extra profits on these. So so and, how, do you, how do you know when these stealth IPOs, like you said, this one had been on your radar for a month, do you, you, yeah. you just have to notice when they open? Is that really what it comes down to? No. So this one, I kind of got wind of it through uh, some of the resources where I'm looking at the filings, who's filing, and, and then I'm quickly, if they're low float and, uh, you know, Chinese, they I then go read their either F1 or their S1 and figure out who the underwriters are. And if it's one of those underwriters that kind of screams, hey, keep an eye out for this one, uh, I'll put, you know, I'll create Google alerts for it. I'll set up some other sort of search filters for it and just check you know i'm checking almost every day what's going on in the ipo world and then when i see this one go onto the schedule you know onto some of the calendars uh, then i send out a newsletter to everybody the day before or the morning of and basically say hey guys this one that i've been you know talking about we talked about this on the show about a month and a half ago a month or so i forget exactly yeah. when it was yeah and uh gave it out and then i'm you know monitor specifically monitoring this uh, ticker this underwriter this you know name of this company and just trying to make sure that i don't miss it because these are exciting especially when i see something that doesn't date we had one of them debut z x j x z n I think it was the debuted at like 45. I mean, that's not when you really want to get into, but if it debuts at uh, sort of in the 10 to as high as say $16 range, that shows that there's, there are a lot of people wanting to buy this. And if it's one of those underwriters that I mentioned, I've taken one or two losses, uh, but you know, from $10 down to $8 or something, Okay, you can lose a couple grand if you're playing for a thousand shares, but look what you can make, you know, on the ones that do run. So I'm so far up that I could you know, get completely wiped out on a few of these before I'd be looking at any kind of of real downside. Okay. And there is sort of there, there is an entire contingent on Twitter that is kind of and now I guess I'm sort of a part of that who's calling these out, is getting people excited about them, and then they show up after the first halt. There's an entire contingent of traders who just try to grab the first, you know trading halt. They get alerts when the, the halt comes in. They have about 10 minutes. These are usually 10 minute halts, 10 minutes to research and figure out, hey, this is a brand new IPO, some random Chinese company, and they all jump in. And it creates that momentum that carries this up into several halts. And there is, you know, there is sort of a difference. And the reason I don't want to hold the whole position into day two is because when they don't make this run, uh, it can pretty quickly uh, you know, fade out into either giving up all your gains, which really sucks when you see like a 10 grand profit uh, dissipate into like a couple hundred dollars that you're selling just to avoid taking a loss. Um, so, you know, get paid. If you want to let part of your position ride, great. Um, but otherwise, you know, take, take, get paid on these, out of these halts. You're not going to reach the very top with your whole position. Take out 30% after the first or second halt. Take another 30% after the next halt. You know, take a, the rest out as soon as you see the reverse or leave, you know, a small position to ride. But these are a great way to take, um, you know, pretty significant profits. And we had another one the very next day um, that wasn't quite uh, a stealth IPO. And it didn't give the two-day run, but it did have an ultra-low float. And there was a lot of buzz about it since they do virtual reality and augmented reality. Right. You know, people were pretty interested in it. Uh, there was a lot of buzz on Twitter. It opened at 1175. It ran up to about uh, 17 teen here. Realistically, you're getting in or out at uh, one of these halts, which was 15. And then you could hold party. I held 20% of my position and sold up here at like 17 at the end of day run. And uh, you had a chance to take some more money if, again, early, early pre-market. This was 5.30 or something, 4, 4.30.
Oh no, Matt, did we lose you? Kind of fading off, especially yeah. if it's not a Chinese one or it's not a, a Boasted or a Network uh, One Financial. Then it's just a low float play. It's not they're not doing anything really to manipulate the price further, and this is all just legitimate trading. Uh, whereas this is something else. So uh, the last one I did want to talk about was DD because I very specifically oh, said yeah, this many, go, many, many times. Do not touch this one. Lay it, lay it on me. Let's go. And the reason the reason was this: three hundred and seventeen million shares. And this was up from something like 290, uh, 290 million shares. They increased it to 317 million shares. And you just got to think to yourself, like, how, how is there going to be that? How many, how many people really want to buy this stock on day one to boost that up? I mean, the other IPOs that we, we, we just looked at two examples that were 3 million shares and 1.75 million shares. Uh, D-Nut. Uh, Krispy Kreme was just under 30 million shares. You know, Uber, I think, was 100 million shares or something like that. So 317 million shares. I don't remember ever seeing an IPO with this many shares. And you say, oh, it doesn't matter. It matters about evaluation. Yeah, but it also mentally people, you know, only going to buy so many shares. And 317 million shares is a ton of shares. And it just, I mean, it just dropped and didn't give you any. I mean, this was no quarter just boom down. And when it's almost anything over about 40, 50 million shares, I'm starting to ask myself, is there really enough demand for this? Is there really a strong enough case to be made for you know, enough retail investors to want to pile in and buy enough shares to push this up? Because the institutions aren't going to buy in. They're either already in uh, or very rarely are going to buy in on day one. They want to, they're, they're going to wait things out, let things level out or they already bought in at the IPO price. So DD was uh, just don't touch it. The IPO was, uh, oh, I have the wrong ticker up there. Why didn't I do that? Uh, the IPO was when? It was on the 30th. So when is the lock? The, the next fun game is when is the lockup expiration? Right? Yeah, that's usually 180 days. Or 100, right. That's usually 180 days. There are times when it's not, but I mean, you can just see DD was right. not a, he so, did start to kind of come back a little bit until that news came out that was just brutal. So six months um, from the, at the end of the end, the end of the year, right? Basically, uh, Basically is, yeah. is, is, is when the lockup or expiration, if it's a normal one, will hit. Then it becomes a fun game of of uh, what do the people who are locked up do? But this was. Uh, the chat's talking about Kramer, who is uh, probably not having his best day today. Um, after saying that, and it goes back to your point, Matt. You know, Kramer said he he didn't think DD had much regulatory risk. Well, how can anybody know that, right? <laughs> um, there's, there's I, no, I tweeted at Kramer on. You know, yeah, he didn't pay attention to my. Yeah, I mean, it's, how are they going to sell 317 million shares? That's what I asked. It's it's a to, it's a great point you bring up about, about the float. We talk about this all the time, right? A low float um, is, you know, easier to push higher or lower, um, but it means there doesn't have to be as much demand. A large float, what, what, what is it, 300 million shares? What was the number? 317 million yeah. shares. There, there's got to be a lot of demand to push those shares higher, and now you've got now you've got the other stuff going on, and then that sort of is like a whole other thing. So, that, I don't know. There's is there any reason to feel good about this one going forward, Matt, or, or not really? Uh, if you really want to buy the bottom, it was, you know, hopefully today. But, uh, again, there's better plays out there with less risk. Uh, DD is not going away. Yeah. Um, I live. I used it multiple times per day when I lived in China, and that was about four or five years ago. Uh, it is ubiquitous. It's on WeChat. Y you know, they... Yeah, they removed it from the app stores and they canceled new account signups, but everybody already has it. It's almost like if Facebook, you know, for a few days was like, uh, we're going to cancel new signups. It's like, well, who cares? Everybody already has a Facebook account. Right. And, you know, so they're not blocking the app from being used. It would cause <laughs> huge pain in people's lives if they did that. And I just don't know what China is going to do next. And I don't see either America or China in the short term, you know, hugging and making up right away. We are fighting over 
uh, kind of the power of the world right now. And Chinese do not, I mean, I don't, as a culture, they are not like straightforward and honest. In my experience in doing business in China, and a lot of people have this experience, is the rules and the laws that we are accustomed to operating under do not apply. People are cutthroat. People are brutal. Uh, and the business, you know, the business environment in China and the government, the way the government treats people and businesses is, look, we are in charge. We will do it how we want to. And whereas in 2002, when I first went to China, people were very, you know, the general attitude was, oh, you know, you're from America. Wow. Uh, we want to be, you know, America's like little brother and like support America and work with America. Like around 2008, they got the Olympics and they're like, no, we're, we're like a serious country. And yeah. like, we are not going to bow to America anymore. We are stronger than America. We have more people. We work harder. We're willing to work for less. Like we, <laughs> and, and they've just been eating our lunch for years. I mean, while we said, oh yeah, you know, Chinese companies can buy, Chinese can buy property in America. Chinese companies can list their companies here. Chinese can like do, you know, use our stuff. They've been saying, look, Facebook, you can't work in China. Google, you can't work in China. Banking, sorry, get out. Like they are not, we are not playing on a level playing field with them. And we don't seem to be waking up to it uh, until maybe just very recently. And, you know, they, like I said, they've been eating our lunch for two decades and we are only now starting to actually realize that um, they are not uh, playing by the rules that we kind of assume that everybody's playing by. And at the end of the day, you know, who's going to probably pay the price for this is a lot of like, you know, retail investors who, who, uh, people like me, who, for example, who, you know, had some exposure and now I don't. Right. Um, but you know, people who buy into the, the, the hype around, you know, these huge companies in China and, you know, when they get the crack, the smackdown, the regulatory smackdown, it's like, well, you know, what's the point of owning this now? But, um, I like to own stocks where I'm mostly confident that there are not a whole lot of downside, you know, risks. Yeah. And yep. I can't say that about anything in China right now. Yep. All right. That was a lot about last week. Yeah. What, what about this week though? What about ironically <laughs> the two IPOs uh, that were you know scheduled for this week are Chinese. Um, oh, one of them was one, one of them was rescheduled from last week. That was a tour lifestyle holdings was supposed to be today and it looks like they have pulled their IPO. It's not showing up on any, you know, let me just check again real quick. But yeah, no uh, indication. Doesn't look like it's going live today. I couldn't, I mean, I started writing up, or I have my newsletter. It's ready to go out. I review you know, these trades a little bit further. Again, sign up, ipowarriors.com, sign up for the newsletter. Um, I wrote up my piece on ATT or rather uh, ATAT copied it from last week and added that I would be very shocked if they uh, actually debuted today, given what's going on in the Chinese regulatory space around uh, not just DD, they also are cracking down on YYM, uh, BZ. These are all recent Chinese IPOs. And it just seems suicidal to uh, for a Chinese company to go live, especially today. And that to me was going to be a little, how ATAT performed today was for me going to be a little bit of a barometer for LDOC, which is, we'll get to in a second, but okay, ATAT got pulled. Um, let's come back to this one. LinkDoc is set for this Friday. It's a AI driven healthcare technology, which means they must have tons of data on healthcare patients, which is exactly what China is cracking down on with DD and YYM. Um, there's a Chinese company with heavy healthcare data analysis. They do a range of things, including uh, kind of patient response to medicine, uh, doctor to patient mat matching and pairing, uh, molecule analysis. They do, they sound pretty cool. And three weeks ago, I'd have said, oh, this looks fun. 10 million, you know, 10.8 million shares, strong rev revenue growth. Um, but, you know, if the sentiment around Chinese stocks is, highly negative by the end of the week, I don't see this one going live. And if it does, and we haven't seen ATAT, you know, go live, I'm not sure this that I want to be in on the, you know, the new style of battleship when they first put it in the water. 
I, I might just say, look, maybe this one sounded good, but now it kind of looks too dangerous. So um, the other IPO on the slate for this week is Moving Image Technologies, MITQ. They basically resell, um, or they're like a reseller for digital cinema equipment. Looks like what? mostly for- what? Oh, oh, they're like a Dolby play, right? Uh, kind of, yeah. They okay. sell for Barco and NEC, like digital projectors. And from checking out their website and the press releases, these are pretty small, almost like home theaters or okay. sort of like company screening rooms, that kind of thing. They also have a very extensive selection of caddies, which are those little cup holders that go between uh, the seats, you know, either at the movie theater, or at stadiums. Um, and of course, none of this sounds particularly interesting, even if you can somehow tie it to an AMC play or something. What is interesting is that the float is just 2.7 million shares, which has been downsized from 3.5 million shares. And what's more interesting is that it's a Boasted Securities uh, IPO. And these are the, you know, this is one of those three uh, underwriters whose, da- whose IPOs somehow seem to, um, you know, soar. And the more I research and try to understand what they're doing and I look at the, the volumes of what's being traded, I mean, if we go back to uh, CPOP, for example, which was last week's big one, and you just look at the volumes in the first uh, minutes of trading, we can see that something funky is going on here. Uh, and when I, when I read about different uh, rug pull strategies and ladder strategies, it's, they seem to align with what we're seeing here. And that is simply where an underwriter or a shareholder, doesn't have to be the underwriter, could be the company itself, is holding on to a huge, I mean, here we have only 100,000 shares uh, 140, 175, 150, uh, maybe big compared to the relative float, but uh, pretty small numbers for triggering, uh, you know, for triggering 10% halts on each one of these. You yeah, see good. halt, 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 halt. Um, and the hypothesis or what seems to be happening, in my opinion, is they are withholding shares and just in either themselves making the trades to, uh, to pop these into halts or just releasing so few shares that there are no, there's no one to sell these. So if all you have is uh, people buying a very small amount of shares that, that are being offered, they're kind of unnaturally forcing these, you know, these pops. And when I see that happening again and again and again by the same underwriters, it starts making me say, okay, well, when we only have 2.7 share, million shares, there's people already talking about this one on Twitter. There were a lot of people talking about CPOP. Um, you know, the chance of an immediate halt seems very high. And that immediate halt, I mean, it very rarely leads to a debut out of that halt that is below where you, you know, the debut price. So you're given a chance to at least say, okay, well, one halt is made 10%. And if you don't see that immediate halt, and I mean immediate, it's not like 10 or 15 seconds. It's like, bam, just open, halt. Okay, there wasn't even like a split second to make a trade you're just still in the trade. Uh, as soon as you see it start to trade a little bit, it might still have some gas in it, but on one on these, especially if it's not a Chinese company or if it's not uh, you know, Boasted or Network One, that's when you say, okay, we'll just hit the sell button. And that is one of the few times where a market order might be your friend. Um, stop losses, too, you know, too dangerous. Uh, limit orders, yeah, maybe, but you're going to set this limit or limit so low that you might as well make it a, a market order because you're really just trying to get out. Um, but the play on these low float, Boasted, Network One is if it doesn't immediately halt, then just get out. Don't wait around and see what it does. And, you know, it's not what you thought it was. If it runs later, great. Otherwise, I'm saying, look, I don't want to own a you know, movie projector company. Uh, you know, just take your money. Yeah, take a little loss if you have to, uh, but just don't get stuck in something that because when they don't go this way, they go real fast the other way, and uh, that's what you want to avoid. This is one of the one the, the one of the the exceptions to the don't sell on day, don't take a loss on day one, 
is you know one of these plays. Uh, all right, that I guess that's it for the week, right? We got two IPOs this week, and, and that's pretty much. Oh yeah, no, there was one more that got added. Uh, we covered this a while ago. It's Arnaz uh, Transcode Therapeutics. Uh, they're an oncology company. They've been rescheduled multiple times in May. Uh, they were a 2.7 million share float. Now they're 6.25 million share float. I show it. Show uh, it. There we go. Arnaz. There. Yeah. Yeah. Ar- are in a young college. Okay. Yeah. So this was getting a bit of hype because it was such a low float play before, but at 6.25 million shares, it's no longer like ultra low. It's just kind of like a small like biotech that does something with cancer. I don't know enough about these to like play them. And there's just too much. I don't know in this one. And with it, when it was a 2.7, it was like, I don't know, but maybe, um, but at 6.25 million shares, it's, I don't know. And if it runs, Good for them. Um, I think I'm going to take a little bit of a breather after the last two weeks just being, so we had something like 30 IPOs over the last two weeks. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like, need to rebalance my portfolio a little bit and do focus on some other things. <laughs> all right, all right. My kids, uh, my, my, my daughter needs some attention. A couple questions before we let you go here. Uh, sure. Do you have any thoughts on the IPO for Niantic Labs? It's from James Adams. Niantic Labs. Are we sure that's an IPO and not an uplisting or a SPAC? That's always a good question. What is the ticker? Uh, I don't know if it's uh, it out yet. What? Um, let me see here. Ba, 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 ba. Hold on, I got my uh, Benzing uh, IPO calendar here. Uh, never mind. I don't actually see a ticker. I don't see anything. So, uh, James Adams, please clarify what if this is an IPO or a SPAC or uplisting. Um, and also, um, oh, yeah, that's Pokemon Go. Right. That's right. That's the company behind Pokemon Go. And that and them and Nintendo, right, are, are the ones behind. Yeah, I don't actually know if it's an IPO, though. Uh, it might be a SPAC. Um, so Second, I don't. I, I would like to touch on or that. Okay, yeah. Shoot the question. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. See what you're gonna say. Okay. People asked me a lot last week about a couple. Uh, they they call them IPOs, but they're really uplistings. Yeah. And I want to show you something that I've seen a trend that I've seen yeah. on uplistings that. So uplistings are things are when something trades on say another country's stock exchange. And then they uplist to the NASDAQ or the NYSE. And almost all the time, we see a huge drop on the um, on the debut. And the reason is because on their local exchange, when they announced, oh, we're going to uplist to the NASDAQ, everybody bought up shares and drove the price up, expecting you know them to make a bunch of money when it listed on the, on the NASDAQ. So wave power, this was an interesting one, eco wave power, uh, debuted at 16. And just tanked down to about 10, 9, 10, 11 range. Now, this is actually an interesting time to pick up some shares because a lot of times this is just everybody who doesn't want it long, who bought into on the uplisting news on the foreign exchange, uh, came in here and said, okay, well, time to take my money. And as soon as it starts to dump, well, everyone else dumps. And it just bottoms out pretty quickly. Now, this one was a little bit ridiculous because what it did the next day was run up to 40 uh, in the early pre-market and then jumped again in uh, regular hours up to 30. And part of it was the free float was just 800,000 shares. And part of it was because it's this kind of interesting turns wave energy into electricity uh, play. But we've seen now with this, and I noticed it also with uh, TRMR, this was about two weeks ago. It did a sort of similar play where it debuted at 19, I believe. If I remember it properly. Yeah, it debuted at 19 and dropped immediately to a bottom of 17, 14. And from there, it kind of dropped even further through the day. But it's now recovered to almost 20, and it's been above 20. So for uplistings, I may be starting to develop a strategy that uh, if it drops super hard like this, take some here and, uh, or, you know, maybe even take more there. If this solid company that sounds good, uh, this was a price that they thought was fair to come to the market. It's just also where people 
decided that they were going to take profits right away. So there does seem to be a pattern of filling this gap pretty quickly, if not um, over time, to uh, to make it an interesting play to take a you know to take a bite off that initial dip and then you know try to ride that that upward trend uh, once people figure out hey actually this company is live people who are selling are gone now what's left in the room are buyers you know people who want to hold long and new buyers showing up so uh, those up listings I don't consider them IPOs but there does seem to be some opportunity because they do show up on the IPO radar sometimes anyway uh, to take some profit off that initial dip. And it's a little bit like the spinoffs, like Vimeo spun off of, uh, I forget what the company was. That was, uh, that was, um, uh, oh God, it was, the, it was, well, it, I, that was IAC, right? Interactive. IAC, right, right, right. right. Yeah. So here, it, it did drop quite a bit on day one, but came back up. Um, but since then, actually, where I thought it went, I thought it went live here and just dropped. Dropped down to 40 by the time you could actually buy it. I think this is actually not accurate data that you could buy it here. I just remember watching on the day it went live that you could actually buy it. It wasn't even available on Webull. They had messed up the ticker. Yeah. And on E-Trade, it dropped down to 40 and actually did take a little bit of a 40 to like 44 play or something there. Um, but if you did buy it down at that bottom of 40, um, you know, it retraced. This wasn't an uplisting, it was a spinoff, but it's one of those, it's a little bit, it's kind of in that category of despacking or, you know, uplistings. They're all a little bit unpredictable, so I don't really like to yeah. play them, but if I see a heavy dip on something, then it's, you know, kind of a good buy low opportunity unless it's uh, some really bad news. All right. Uh, we've been on with Matt Hammond for the last like almost hour. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, Matt normally joins us every Monday at 9 a.m. on pre-market prep to preview the week. Obviously, this week is different because we had no show Monday. So he was on Power Hour today. He always recaps the previous week in IPO land and previews the upcoming week in IPOs. And I will just say, Matt, that we did a little quick Inform One Chat challenge last week trying to pick the best performing stock. Uh, of the week and all of all the submissions we got, uh, the winner had picked Donut and I came in second and I had picked LZ Legal Zoom. So it was a strong week last week on the. I would have said C Pop. You would have said C Pop. <laughs> you would have won. It turns out. Uh, all right, uh, Matt Hammond, IPOWarriors.com newsletter goes out whatever Sunday night. Well, it goes more often than that. But the okay, so I, I send out the recap of last week's trades uh, on Sunday uh, or sometime during the weekend. And now I've switched to, I'm going to send out the recap after the show. So if you guys, or, or sorry, wow. the preview of this week after the show. Got so it. after this, if you guys sign up for the newsletter now, uh, in about an hour or two, I'll send out the preview of this week's IPOs. And... Uh, if I do see any stealth IPOs show up, sometimes they show up midweek. Um, that's what makes them stealthy. So if I see them, I send out a notification on Twitter. If it's just like, sometimes I'll figure it out an hour before or even just half an hour before it goes live. But usually I've got caught wind of it the night before. I can get out a news blast either that night or early in the morning. So if you want to catch those ghost uh, stealth IPOs, sign up for the newsletter. If you want to get the preview of the week coming up, sign up for the newsletter. Um, I think it's uh, been pretty helpful for a lot of people. People have been uh, donating to my whiskey fund um, when they make wins. So right. link, thanks, guys. Link in description, Twitter in description. Thanks a lot, Matt. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you again next Monday. Thanks, Matt, sir. All right. Have a good week. Okay. Uh, that was Matt Hammond. Uh, again, links all in the description. Uh, somebody asked, I saw a quick question in the chat. How do you find information on IPOs? You can go to the filing. You can go to Benzinga Pro, which has all this information in here. We have a yeah, let me just go to, you can have an IPO calendar uh, and you can uh, search that, go to our news feed, search for updates. For, for example, Robinhood is H-O-O-D. Oh, we don't actually have anything on the news feed, but if you go to Robinhood and in the news feed, you can search for all the uh, headlines related to Robinhood's IPO. Or if you don't have Benzinga Pro, very simple, 
go to this link and I'll put the link in chat right now. Benzinga.com slash calendars slash IPOs is a free resource on our site with an IPO calendar, all of our IPO articles, uh, our articles related to IPOs at least. And uh, that's right there. That's free. Benzinga.com slash calendars slash IPOs. Um, and to dive deep on any one IPO, uh, there's always the S1 filing that comes out before the fact. But uh, putting that link out there. Uh, okay. It is 157. I did mention yesterday or just now that we did a chat challenge last week. Uh, and I want to congratulate the winner of said chat challenge. Jason W. picked Donut. That was the best performing stock, if you can believe it. It was a pretty brutal week. Uh, for the tickers that were thrown out in this chat challenge. We did it from Tuesday's close to Friday's close. And D-Nut was your winner. You're <laughs> sort of crazy when, when you look at the chart. Let's zoom out. But uh, D-Nut was the winner. Uh, a 17% increase from the I, from the opening price to Friday's close. And uh, congratulations, Jason W. Um, Jason, if you are watching... Email us, shows at Benzinga.com, uh, because we didn't put any place in the form. So we, we, we did the so hatchet job so last minute that we didn't put any any spot in the spreadsheet for uh, for your contact info. So Jason W., email shows at Benzinga.com. We'll hook you up with some swag. Uh, okay, that is going to be a wrap for uh, Jason B. Were you on, were you on there? Uh Jason B, you were – Jason B, you came in dead last, my man. You came in dead last. <laughs> Sorry, somebody had to come in last. And in this case, it was you. Um, okay, that's going to be a wrap for uh, the Power Hour today, special two-hour edition. Tomorrow, uh, we'll have the two-hour edition of Moon or Bust going from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. But right now, we have the Benzinga Crypto Show starting in like, I don't know, like 30 seconds, give or take a few seconds from now. Um, we've got a full slate of guests and a great guest on the docket, Argo Blockchain. You guys know that one? Publicly traded company. The CEO will be on the show this stream in about 15 minutes or so that's peter wall argo let me bring up the chart for you you all can see what i'm talking about a r b k f is your ticker argo blockchain ceo will be on this stream at 2 15 and the crypto show is starting right now so it'll redirect to that and you don't have to do anything just before you go do me a solid Drop us a like, smash the like button, hit subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. We'd appreciate that. Thanks to all of our guests. Thanks to you for watching, listening, whatever. The show is available as a podcast. And uh, please remember that all the information from our show and all of our shows meant to be used as informational purposes, not for investing or trading advice. That's a wrap. Crypto show up now. Everyone, I'll see you, see you a little bit later.